Uh, hey, listen, man, we're glad you're here. We're going through the book of Revelation. And I thought yesterday, what we're going through is so appropriate because yesterday was the, the anniversary of just the, one of the horrific events in the, uh, the history of our nation, right? 9-11, we affectionately know. I know some of you are not old enough <coughs> to remember that because you weren't alive. Others, you're not old enough because you were too young. If you are, here's what you, you, you know about 9-11. You remember exactly where you were. You remember what you were doing. Uh, I, I remember it, I was asleep because it was, it, I was on the West Coast. I was in L.A., and it was like five in the morning. My phone started ringing, everybody, you know, and, and so you turn on, and you're in shock, and you're in awe, and you go through these days of haze. You're doing nothing but watching the news. You're doing nothing but trying to find answers, and you're shocked. I, the whole country was shocked and all that kind of stuff, and so here we are 20 years later, and we, we didn't need to let it go by because we need to remember what happened because I think, and, and you know, probably two years ago, as I met with our staff and I said, I, th- I feel like the Lord leading me to preach through Revelation. I've never preached through it. Uh, I really feel like the Lord leading us to preach through Revelation. Now, you know, it's sort of when all the pandemic hit, uh, when all the crazy that's hit over the last two years, it's like, thank you, Lord, because this book gives hope in a crazy world. And, and when things like 9-11 happen, we have hope because we look at that and we say, why? Why is all this happening? Uh, because there's evil in the world, but there will be a day when all evil is, is stomped and made right, okay? And that's what this book teaches us. And so uh, I didn't want to let yesterday, or I'm sorry, the anniversary go by without saying something. And in doing that, thanking all of our first responders. We have a lot of first responders and all of our military folks for what you do uh, in, in our world. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, we, we do live in a crazy world, don't we? I think we all agree. Our, our world is crazier than sprayed roads, isn't it? I mean, man, it's like we went to bed one night and it's almost like we woke up the next morning and the world we knew was gone quicker than a PBR at a, at a NASCAR race, right? I mean, it was just like, what happened all of a sudden? Well, here's, here's what the, 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 the crazy thing, the good thing, the absolute blessed thing is, only we Christians can make sense out of it. Did you know that? That's, that's, the, that's the thing is, because only the Bible lets us know what's really going on. Uh, it, it lets us know what the world really is and what it's about and what's going on. Because you see, the, the, the Bible lets us know that the answer is not in Washington, D.C., because the problem is not political. The answer is not on Wall Street because the problem is not financial. You see, all these things are smoke screens. They're really symptoms of the real disease. They're symptoms. They're not the disease. They're symptoms of the disease. The, the problem is not spiritual. I mean, the problem is not political. The problem is not financial. The problem is spiritual. It's sin. And so the answer is not money. The answer is not education. The answer is not legislation. The answer is Jesus. Okay? That's the answer. And, 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 and revelation, that's what makes revelation so good because we look at the crazy world and we say, why is that happening? What's going on? Why do these people hate each other so much more now than ever? And we thought we'd made all kind of progress. And why is there so much tension between societal tension? Why is crazy still happening? Why is Taliban still killing people in Afghanistan? Why is Chinese, China still, still loading uh, we, the, the a group, people group on trains. All, why is this happening around our world? What's going on in our country? And I, I just can't make heads and or tails of it. What's going on? Well, uh, Revelation is special because John is given a vision by Jesus and he pulls back the curtains and he lets us know what's going on behind the scenes uh, of the world. And he lets us know why our world is the way it is and what, you know, and, 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 if, and it's this spiritual battle that's raging between the lamb, Jesus, and the dragon, Satan. It, it, and it, it, it's not like don't fall into this myth or, or every now and then think like, well, there's a battle going on, which means the outcome is, is up in the air. It's not. That's, that's what's great about Revelation. There's a battle going on, but the outcome is settled. Jesus wins, right? And so we have hope in the midst of hopelessness, right? We can have peace in the midst of chaos, that's what's so great about Revelation. And I want to say this, and uh, as, before we dive into the passage today, is I, I, go back and listen to the series if you haven't listened or watched, because you, really it needs to build. And, and I said this in the very first series, is uh, most people probably in, in uh, listening online, wherever you live, uh, is our, what, we, what we consider a futurist view or a dispensationalist view of Revelation. That's not 
my interpretation of Revelation. It once was, okay? It once was my view. It's not anymore, and, uh, and so uh, I am, I'm preaching not from that view, and so as I go through this, and, you know, and I have people come up, and, and my objective here is to not, oh, man, when you leave here, you got to, that's not my objective, all right? Uh, because I once was a dispensationalist. I'm not anymore. This is a third tier. When, in, in other words, the Bible is all important, but when it comes down to eschatology about, okay, is Jesus gonna come and then rapture and then a seven-year tribulation and then Jesus is gonna come for a third time and all, all that stuff, it, 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 that, that, right, that is a third-tier deal, which means, man, we can disagree and laugh about it or whatever, okay? So I just, I, I don't wanna create, I, I say that because I don't want you to, to create any attention or say, wow, he believes that. And I, no, that's not what this is at all, okay? Just, I just want you to understand that. So I said that in the first, I wanna reiterate that now because it's different than left behind. And so I just wanted you to, to, to understand that. So let's dive in to the passage. Today, we're gonna to look at 17. It's more than a mouthful, folks, okay? It, it is more than a mouthful. And so uh, when, I, when I look at this passage, uh, it, it is very vivid. I mean, it is very clear about what this passage is, is all about. And, uh, but also, it's so full of images, it can muddy the water. And so let's look at it, and I don't want you to get so caught up, but it's a mouthful. As we read this, I'm gonna read the entire chapter. As we read this, don't blink, okay? Because if you blink, you're gonna say, where'd they go by the time you look again? Because this is a mouthful. So let's look at it at 17, all right? And so here we go. Let's dive in. Uh, I mean, hold your breath. We're going under right here, all right? Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the king of, kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and of the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on the forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw a, the woman drunk with the blood of the saints the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and 10 horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This is calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains and on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eight, but it belongs to the seventh if I clear on that, and it goes to destruction. And the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, one hour, get this, together with the beast. These are not of one mind, I'm sorry, these are of one mind, and they, hit, they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the 10 horns that you saw, they, are, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Whew. Anybody wanna preach that? <laughs> That's a mouthful, isn't it? I mean, man, that is, 
a mouthful, right? And there is, it's a loaded passage. There is so much there. We could really preach forever, and I'm gonna do something crazy. I'm gonna preach one message on that chapter, okay? So in saying that, here's what I want you to do. There is so many images here. It is loaded with images. There's image after image after image after image, and you wanna stop and say, what's that? What's the seventh? It's the eighth, but it's the seventh. What, what is this red beast of seven heads and ten? What is all of that? I mean, you, you want to stop and say, what in the world is this? It's the reason a lot of people are confused by Revelation. It's the reason a lot of people are scared of Revelation, right? Uh, and so, so what I don't want you to do today is you've heard the old saying, you can, uh, you, know, you can see the trees and miss the forest or see the forest and miss the trees. What I don't want you to do today is get so caught up. I want to explain some of these images to you. So hopefully you'll understand this passage a little better today. But I don't want you to get so caught up in the images that you completely miss the point of, I think, what John is trying to bring out for us here, okay? And here's the point. I believe this passage gives us a picture of the schemes of the beast and how he tries to take out the church and sideline the church. And if you don't know the schemes of the beast, then you can can absolutely be vulnerable to being taken out, okay? And so, so the first scheme that we're going to look at here is the sword. It's the sword of the beast. It's, it's, the, it's the brutality of the beast. And so the prostitute, it says, is, is mounted on a, a, a scarlet beast, a red beast, scarlet beast with seven heads and 10 horns. Now, I want you to think about that, man. That's a gnarly looking beast, isn't it? I mean, man, is she, it's like you got a prostitute and she's riding, is it a dragon? What kind, what's the heads look like? Because some of them have horns and some of them not have horns because there's seven heads, but there's 10 horns. So some of them have more than one horn. I mean, I, well, I don't know the details. It, it gives us a glimpse of what it, uh, you know, the generality of it, but it's gnarly, isn't it? I mean, it's one of those things, if you see this in a dream, man, you're going to have to get up and change your pants, right? I mean, that is a gnarly beast. What is it? Well, we got to understand that remember, in Revelation, we're talking about apocalyptic literature. This is not like a literal beast that, and he even tells us that. It's not a literal beast. He's talking about kingdoms, and here, here, here's, here's what it is. The seven heads, uh, seven and ten numbers in Revelation, numbers are not necessarily literal. They are a symbol, right? And so you got seven heads, uh, which this connects back to the beasts in Daniel 7. It connects back to the beast, and, and, and the beast and Daniel represent evil world empires or kingdoms, okay? You got horns. Now, horns represent power. Ten is complete. Uh, seven and ten are complete or perfect. So horns are power, so you got a complete power. This connects the, to, to the fourth beast of Daniel, which is a composite beast. So what you have here is not this gnarly looking literal uh, dragony beast looking thing with seven heads and 10 horns. He's using the symbolism to talk about all the world powers that are brutal uh, and, and, and have about this brutal attack against God and Christianity all through the ages. It was Babylon. It was Rome in the day of John. It is the Taliban today. It is ISIS today. It is Boko Haram today. It is all of these evil empires and kingdoms. It is the, the, the communist Chinese. It was the, you know, it, it was Nazi Germany. It's all of these evil, brutal empires that, that mount an attack against God's people to wipe them out. And then it says that the prostitute is riding a red beast. Now, uh, red uh, connects her th this this with the with the dragon right and who was the dragon it was satan the ancient serpent so the red dragon red was a symbol of the blood on his hands from the generational mass murder of god's people all through history and and, and you see that the prostitute it says is drunk with the blood of the martyrs so what is john showing us here the angel shows john a vision of the sword of the beast he shows John a vision of how the beast, how the, how the dragon and the beast is going to try to take out the church, and that is through the sword. That's one of the schemes. That's one of the, 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 that's one of the, the schemes, the strategies is to use the sword. Think about John in his day when he was writing this, and here's what you got to know. When you read Scripture, there is a context to Scripture. Scripture can never mean what it never meant. Does that make sense? 
So we gotta get down and say, what did this mean when John wrote this? Well, in the time of John's writing, remember he wrote to the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation two and three, and those churches were going through intense persecution. I mean, they, were, they had to bow to the emperor of Rome and they would erect statues of the emperor. And if you didn't bow to the emperor, remember back in Daniel's day, uh, it was the Daniel in the lion's den. You remember if he didn't bow to, and, and then he was thrown in the lion's den. In John's day, if they didn't bow to the emperor, they would be killed. They, they couldn't work. They couldn't support their family. Their families were being ran out of town, right? And so there was this brutal attack on Christians, uh, and they don't, the, the governments didn't care if you worship Jesus or the tree or whatever, as long as you gave your allegiance to them, right? And so that, that was what was going on in John's day. And so you got these Christians who love the Lord, they've given their life to the Lord, but their loved ones are being killed. They're being ran out of town. And so they're thinking, what in the world is going on? And John is, is saying, here is the scheme of the enemy. There's this battle that's taking place behind the scenes. It's a spiritual battle between the dragon and the lamb. And don't be confused when it looks like the, the dragon wins around by killing Christians in Afghanistan because Jesus has already won. The, the outcome is not up in the air. That's what John's writing, to let us know of the scheme of the sword. Now, we, here's what we know. Uh, all through history, Christians are, are, have been martyred, have been killed, have been ran out of town. Man, it was happening in John's day. It's happening, it, it happened all the way up through. It happened, remember, when, when, when Herod tried to kill the babies. It happened when Jesus was born, the, the boy's two years old and under. It, it happens today in Afghanistan. I mean, you, you, you've read and we've seen, you know, last week we read one particular story of an entire underground church, underground because it was hiding to worship that, that, that was just mowed down. Boys, girls, men, women was mowed down because they followed Jesus. I don't know if you knew this or not, but in July, Christians, churches in, in, in Afghanistan, because of where the country had seemingly gotten, had begun to register their allegiance to Jesus Christ. You would go to the police station and register your allegiance. Now, the Taliban is using this to go in and hunt down and find Christians and churches and mow them down. It's happening today. To the point, it's happening in China today. It's happening in, in, in uh, Libya today. It's happening in Somalia. Today. It's happening all over the world today, folks. As a matter of fact, more Christians have been killed in the last 200 years than in the last 2,000 combined. Did you understand that? You see, we are blessed to, have, to be living in the country that we live in. And, and that we, I was born into a country, and I've lived in a country that I can literally preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it goes out around the world to anybody around the world with internet access, except in countries like China, where people cannot watch this unless they have a VPN because it's monitored and shut down. Uh, but I, I, I'm blessed to live in a country, to be born in a country, where I've got the freedom to tell anybody about Jesus on the street or declare it from this stage without fear that the government, the beast is gonna come in and mow me down and mow you down. You see, in Pakistan today, you got people who meet and they're bored when they're in church and people show up and bomb the church and kill everybody in it or they board the doors and set the church on fire and kill everybody in it. That's in Pakistan today. In Afghanistan, if they find a church, they immediately mow it down and shoot it, right? I mean, in Somalia, that's why Boko Haram kidnaps young girls and it's all over the world. We don't hear about it as much because the media doesn't report on it, except in a Christian news outlet, you might read some, but Voices of the Martyrs is a great place to go. V-O-M, Voices of the Martyrs, the persecuted church, those are great places to go to understand what's going on in our world because if you don't, then we begin to put it out of sight, out of mind, and we don't understand that we are in a pocket. Now, will it always be that way? I don't know. Neither do you. It's not looking good, but will it always be that way? I think we're about to lose some freedoms. I think we're, we're about to lose some freedoms that will be called maybe hate speech and some other things. But here's the thing, right now I have an opportunity. Right now you have an opportunity. And to whom much is given, much is expected. We've been given much with our freedom, much is expected. And have we taken advantage of it or have we taken it for granted in America? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. You see, this has been going on ever since through the history because of sin and because of evil, the sword of the beast, to try to oppose God and knock out God's people. But here is the issue with the sword. It rarely works. 
Oh, man, might it take out all the Christians in a specific area? Yeah, but it rarely works because you know what the sword does? It actually strengthens the church in places where, where there's persecution because it strengthens the believer and it weeds out fake cultural Christians. Because let me, let me tell you something. If you're a cultural Christian, you're not gonna have your head chopped off. I mean, man, if, if, you're, if you won't be reviled for Christ, you certainly won't be killed for Christ. And see, in America today, I, I hate to classify what we go through as persecution in America because, man, when people in, in Pakistan uh, and, and Afghanistan and people like that are being uh, murdered and having their heads chopped off, it's hard for me to say I'm persecuted in America. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a scale, but we definitely are reviled and maligned in America if you're a Christian today. You're a bigot. You got hate speech. You, you know, all this kind of stuff. Christians are the most oppressed people group in the history of the world. Nobody talks about that. We are the most oppressed of anybody. And nobody talks about that. Okay, so that means if you're not willing to lose your job, you certainly won't be willing to lose your head. If you're, you know, physicians, they may have to make a choice one day. Am I, gonna, if, am I, am I going to perform an abortion or am I going to uh, honor my conviction? And, and, and will, will I lose my license if I'm an attorney, if I won't represent this person? If, I'm, if I own a cake shop, if I don't make a cake for this, will I, will I lose my license to do business? What, will I be sued? Uh, we we got to make choices every day. And if you will not be reviled for Christ, you certainly will not be killed for Christ. All right? Now, that, that's, that's a wake-up call and say, let's take, uh, th- let's take this advantage of this time and moment that we're in and not take it for granted. So the one is the sword, but the sword typically makes the church stronger so that he moves on to another scheme that we see right here. We see another scheme, uh, and it's seduction. You see, the sword is painful, and the sword is, is brutal, but the most destructive and effective uh, is not the sword. Uh, it, it, is, it is seduction. It's not threatening your body. It's seducing your heart. You see, it's stuff like the glamour and the pleasure and the wealth of Babylon that pulls you away from Jesus and into the arms of another lover that John calls the prostitute whose pimp is the beast. And that's what we see in this passage. It's this seduction that that, that is taking place. And in that day, again, as we go back to the context of when this was written, think about Rome. Rome was a cesspool of immorality. I mean, even their historians wrote about how nasty and awful Rome was in this time. One of their historians, Tacitus, he wrote that that all immoral and evil and disgusting things found their home in Rome. Here's how bad it was. Claudius was one of their emperors, and his wife's name was Messalina. The emperor's wife, we're told, sold her body in a brothel in the evenings. The emperor's wife, because she chose to, was a prostitute. If, you, if the emperor's wife is so immoral, what do you think the rest of the country is going to be, right? That's how immoral, that's the world, this seductive power of pleasure, of free love. That's the power of the seduction, and that's the world that John's readers lived in. Our world is very similar, right? I mean, and it, it's went on for history. If you go back, all the way back to to. to when Israel came out of Egypt. Israel was in Egyptian slavery for 400 years. The book of Exodus tells this story. They cried out, God sent Moses. Moses goes in and through the 10 plagues that God did, they're brought out. And when they're brought out, they, they, God takes them to the Red Sea, destroys the Egyptians, makes a way for the Israelites to escape. So they're going on their way to the promised land. Well, the king of Moab's name was uh, uh, Balak. Balak heard that they were coming he had heard what happened to the Egyptians. Now, Egypt was the world's superpower in that day. Nobody could defeat the Egyptians. Now, a, a ragtag bunch of slaves, not the slaves, but their God, destroyed the Egyptians. I mean, made them look silly. He destroyed them so bad. So Balak's scared. Here comes this group of people. If they can knock out Egypt, man, imagine what they can do to me. So he hires a guy named Balaam to curse Israel. God wouldn't allow it to happen because God said, I'm not gonna allow my people to be cursed. So Balaam tells Balak, he gives him some advice. You, you, you wanna knock them off course? You wanna knock them off course? You, you wanna take them out of the game? Seduce them with the lovely daughters of Moab. That's what he said, if you remember. And you know what it did? It worked. Put the pleasure before them. Put sexual immorality before the men. And man, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be like a, a hound on a hare. I mean, they'll just be coming off course so much. I mean, man, seduce them and it worked. 
And then you have Jesus or John and, and, and Jesus back in the book of Revelation now, all the way forward, in Revelation 2 and 3. Remember who Jesus wrote this to? Churches. Seven churches in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. One of those churches was the church at Pergamum. And Jesus had a word for the church at Pergamum. And what was his word? His word was, you tell the church in Pergamum that they are, have some who are holding the teachings of Balaam. We just talked about that story. They have some who are holding the teachings of Balaam who are putting a stumbling block before God's people by teaching, by, by leading them astray into eating meat sacrificed to idols and to sexual immorality. He told that to the church at Pergamum. He also told the church in Thyatira that you tolerate that Jezebel. Now, whether Jezebel was a real woman in Thyatira, or you remember Jezebel in the Old Testament was a wicked woman. And so, you know, today you call someone a Jezebel, you're referring to, man, that's a, that's a wicked woman right there, right? And so, so he says, you tolerate that Jezebel who's teaching uh, people to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. And so, so, so the point is that if the dragon cannot get you with the sword, he, he's gonna try to get you with seduction. He's gonna try to seduce your heart with pleasure. Get, get, get pulled off into pornography. Get pulled off into this affair. Get pulled off into this sexual immorality. Get pulled off into pleasure. Get pulled off into wealth and money. It's, you know, it's not so much the money, but it's the stuff money can buy. Get pulled off into stuff, right? Get pulled off into sports. Get pulled off into all these things, ambitions and career. Get pulled off and seduced and sidetracked by all these things that distract you from Jesus and pull you away into the arms of another lover when Jesus is the only one who really loves you. That's, the, that's the, the strategy and the scheme. That's what we see going on. That's what you see over and over here, right? That, I mean, that, that's what you see going on. John said the, the prostitute is seated on many waters. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's like the seven seas, and he even says the many waters. The many waters are all the nations of the earth. You know, the nations, people, languages, tongue. We see that throughout Revelation. It's talking about the world. He says the seduction that the enemy uses, there's pockets and places and countries, specifically we know, ruled by, by militant Islam, where people are killed, but not just, uh, if they follow Jesus, but not just militant Islam in North Korea, uh, you know, which is not Islamic, but in North, North Korea, you've got places in India, you've got, uh, which is Islamic and militant Hindu, uh, and so you've got all these, all these pockets where the sword is prevalent and will be, and you don't ever know where that pocket's gonna move, but all the world is, is affected by the seduction of the prostitute. He says all the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with the prostitute, and all the earth dwellers are drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. What does that mean? Well, remember in Scripture what sexual immorality refers to. Now, again, to know what scripture means, you gotta know what it meant. And there are contexts to where sexual immorality means sexual immorality. Sometimes the word is porneia, which obviously where we get the word pornographic, and it's, sometimes it's used as a junk drawer term for all things sexual immoral. Sometimes it's very specific with whatever sexual immorality it is. Sometimes it talks about sexual immorality of, of, of sex before marriage. Uh, or sex with, uh, after marriage with someone that's not your spouse, or sex between a woman and a woman, or a man and a man, or, 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 or a human and a beast, bestiality. Those are all sexually immoral acts in the Bible. And so, so sometimes it refers to sexual immorality as literally sexual immorality. But, but here's what God does. He uses sexual immorality to also, he uses it as a metaphor for Christians, people who claim Jesus Christ, but they turn and they give their heart to another God, and here's what the Bible says. You're whoring after other gods. You hoard after other gods is what God says. He uses that as a metaphor. Why? Think about your marriage. That's why your marriage is so sacred. He uses your marriage as a symbol of our relationship because the, your marriage bed is undefiled. Your marriage bed should be pure. It should be holy. It should be sacred. It should be sanctified. It should be uh, uh, marked by fidelity and faithfulness because that's what your relationship with Jesus. He's my God. I give my heart to him. I give my allegiance to him. Your marriage is a reflection of that. That's why sex is not just about pleasure, but the enemy, the beast, makes you 
uh, whore after the prostitute, but by distraction and by seduction. That's why it's so much more destructive even than the sword. And so, so, so what we see here is he says that the kings have, all the kings have, have committed sexual immorality and the earth dwellers are drunk with the wine of sexual immorality. What does it mean? It means people all over the world are, are, are literally Christians all over the world. Kings are, are following the, the prostitute all over the world. Earth dwellers are those who do not follow Christ in Scripture, in specifically Revelation. So when you see dwellers on earth or earth dwellers, it means non-Christians. They are drawn away and are just giving themselves completely to the prostitute. They're giving themselves completely to the prostitute. Notice what it says here. It says that she's dressed. Notice how it describes her. John says, he describes her like, much like you would think of a prostitute. She's got these expensive or gaudy clothes on, right? Expensive jewels, man. She's got high heels on. I mean, it makes it sound like, man, she's all painted up like she's been to made up, make makeup like she's been in a paintball fight. I mean, she's got Botox going on probably. I mean, you know, th- th- this, is a, this, this, this prostitute here, he describes her as looking a certain way. And it says that, that she's got, she's holding within her hands, or, 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 or well, let me say she's got a, a, a band on her head with the name Babylon. What, what is all that about? I mean, she's dressed in all this. She's got a band on. It was said in Rome, and that day, prostitutes would wear a band on their head with their name on their head. Why? Uh, I mean, man, you can dig into it. I really don't know. Maybe it's their billboard. It's like, hey, this is my name. Tell your buddies about me. I don't know. It's their advertisement. You know, it's, they didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Instagram. That's how they advertise. So, uh, but I don't know why, but they, that, that's what we're told. That they, they, were, they were headbands, had their name written on their head. This woman, dressed, gaudy, dressed in those expensive clothes and jewels and high heels and all made up, she's got a band on her name. What's the, uh, on her head? What's it say? Babylon, the mother of all prostitutes. So Babylon, remember, was this real kingdom. And they come in and they conquered Israel. Go back to the book of Daniel. Go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They Babylon, they came in, they conquered Israel, hauled them off as slaves, and made them worship other gods, led them to worship other gods. So then Babylon was conquered, and what happened is the word Babylon, just like Jezebel, it, we use you Jezebel, well, it might not be that woman's name, but it means that woman's wicked. Well, Babylon is not literal Babylon here. It is, became synonymous for any world kingdom power, uh, worldview, system that opposes God and his people. I mean, it is the Taliban. It is Boko Haram. It, 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 it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, ancient Rome. It is consumerism, not just communism, but also consumerism. It is Hollywood. It, it, it is the music industry and things in the music industry that are completely anti. It is le- po- politicians when they legislate immoral and ungodly legislation. It, it, it is uh, not all politicians. We got some great ones, but not all politicians. Let, let me make sure you understand. But but though it it, it is those uh, that that uh, do ungodly legislation. It, 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 it is anything that opposes God. That is Babylon, right? And it says that she wears this this band with Babylon on her head. And she holds her cup filled with impurities and debauchery and, I mean, and people, and they get drunk on it. And what is, well, everything in that cup is everything that is enticing and seducing that pulls you away from God. Man, it, it, you're, you get drunk on it because, you, I mean, it, it looks so alluring and so appealing and you drink just a little and you want a lot and before you know it, man, you're out of your mind and, 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 and man, you, 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 you think you're having a good time and you wake up tomorrow and you're hor- you feel horrible and you don't even remember it and, and it, it's just stupidity. That's the picture we get here. That's the picture we get. And, in other words, here's what, here's what John is telling us here. John is giving us a picture of the sword, but of the seduction that gets Christians in the last days, pulls them away from Christ. And it's the seduction that's deadly because when you got your head on a chopping block, man, you know that you're under the scheme of the enemy. Here's the sad thing. When you got your head on a chopping block, when, 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 when uh, ISIS comes up and puts a gun to the back of your head on a beach and, and says, deny Christ or die, you know this is the sword of the enemy. It's clear. Man, when a church is burned down or bombed in Pakistan, when people come into Afghanistan and mow down every Christian boy and girl, man and woman in a church, 
when, when people in China are hauled off on trains, when, 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 I mean, when the largest church in China two years ago was destroyed and t- because uh, of the, the beast. And so, so when, when, when that starts to happen, you know, man, when you lose your job because you stand for your convictions and you refuse to sit down, you know, that's the scheme of the beast. I mean, man, when, when, when people malign you and make fun of you because, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm, this is the way I'm going to live. When you're maligned for that, when you're maligned because you literally believe that a baby is a, is a human being in the womb, when you're maligned for that, Man, you got to make a decision. Do I want to be maligned or do I want to feel like I'm stupid here? But you know you're under the scheme, right? Those are, you know you're under the scheme of the sword of the, of the enemy. But, but, but let me tell you, here's what's sad. When men and women go home and, man, they're watching hours of pornography, they're failing to realize that you're under the seduction of the enemy. You're in the grips of the seduction of the enemy who's pulling you away and you're whoring after another God. Oh, but I'm not worse. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, we do. Man, when, when Christians uh, take their money and their money is all spent on them and, man, they don't even tithe, which is what tithing is all about, really. It's not that God needs your money. He wants your heart. And, and if you don't tithe, it's like, man, I'm giving my heart. I'm, he, that's why he says where your treasure is, there your heart will follow. Where your heart is, there your treasure will follow. You know, And, and, and so, so it's not about your money. It's about your heart. And why do 90-some percent of Christians around the world don't tithe? because they're whoring after another God. And it's not just the money, it's the stuff I can't have if I give my money to God. What does that say? I'm whoring after another God. And we don't even realize that. Man, we got our head in the chopping block. Oh, I'm under the scheme of the enemy. But man, when we're not tithing, when we're, when we're spending our money, when we're living for money, when we're, when, when we're looking at pornography, uh, man, when we're living with our boyfriend or our girlfriend, you know, all, all of these things, and we're like, I, I, I don't know if I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not being, listen, that's, that's what's so sad. That's why it's so destructive. That's why the church gets so ineffective and, and, and weak in so many areas because people are in the seduction of the enemy and, and they, they don't even know it. And, you know, uh, and, and so, you know, there's a debate in our world about, there's a de- debate in our country, I should say, about how Christian our founding fathers were. Some people's like all in on our founding fathers were Christians, and man, they loved the Lord. And some of them were like, I don't know, Thomas Jefferson cut holes in the Bible, and I mean, you know, they were deists, but were they Christian? There's a debate on whether how Christian they were, but here's what's not a debate. They literally believed in biblical principles, and it was about morality because they knew, they knew that a country that lost its morality lost its freedom. All you gotta do is look around the world and around history and know a little bit of history and you'll realize they they were right. And I think it's becoming crystal clear in America. When you lose your morality, you lose your, you will lose your freedom. And so we, we, we see here the sword, very painful, very dangerous. We see the sword and we see seduction. It's even more dangerous and even more, more effective because people are in its grips. And that's how the enemy, and, and when you see this whole image here, you see, that's why, that's why I told Walter, you know, a while ago, it's like, I bet the image I'm talking about, you know, they, the, the prostitute, the whore here, and I know somebody said, he said whore in church. Hey, before you send me an email, it's in the Bible, okay? I, I'll, it's in the Bible, so I'm reading the Bible. And so, he, he, you see this image, and that's the image God uses to say, are you a pure bride, or are you a whore? Well, that's pretty direct, isn't it? That's pretty direct. That's a question we must ask ourselves. And it can get hopeless in our world. It can get like, oh, this, look at what's going on, man. Look at what's going on in Afghanistan on top of what's going on in America with the social unrest, on top of the pandemic that's driving people absolutely nuts and crazy that people will literally argue over a, a mask and, 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 and over what else. And, 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 and everybody's like, you're gonna do what I want you to do to protect me or you're gonna do what I wanna do because I'm right. And I mean, it is absolutely, I, I mean, I, I laugh at people on Facebook who get on there and gripe about people on Instagram either end of that deal. It's laughable, those people, because all they're saying is that person's an idiot, and you're looking like an idiot saying that person's an idiot. You ever thought about that? It, what's going on in our world? Why is it so crazy? Because we've seen the seals, we've seen the trumpets, and we've seen the bowls. 
We know that it's getting worse and it's getting worse and it's getting worse. And you're beginning to see Revelation 17 play out before your very eyes. You're seeing the sword all over the world. Man, you're seeing seduction in America. People are worshiping themselves. People are worshiping their kids. You ever thought about how we worship our kids? You think about what you worship and what you whore after, and you can whore after your kids. Did you realize that? Oh, man, I gotta, I gotta give my kids everything. I gotta, I gotta make sure my kids are doing, I got, man, there are people that miss entire seasons of churches all over the country because, man, I, I'm making sure my kid does this. I told our parents before, I, I told our parents before church this morning at breakfast and we, we was meeting with these parents and I said, listen, you can spend a lot of money and a lot of time and I, I've got five kids. Man, I, I, I wanna be a good daddy and a good daddy is not giving my kids everything they want, believe me. I, 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 you, you know what I'm talking about. That's not a good daddy necessarily. But I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna find what my kids do well and I wanna, I wanna fan that flame, right? Because I teach my kids, you can't be anything you wanna be. If, if your teacher tells you that, you tell them, your da- my daddy said you're a liar. You don't know what you're talking about. If your teacher says, whatever, my, now, now their teacher's <laughs> their mama right now, but, uh, but if, if you're, I, I always tell my kids, hey, if your teacher says you can be anything you wanna be, say, hey, my daddy says you're a fool. Not quite like that. Because you can't be anything you wanna be. Man, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful, I'm honored to be a pastor, but if I could be anything I'd want to be, I'd be throwing touchdowns right now today. It's Sunday, which means 10 minutes to kick off. Listen, uh, let's, we, we're going to a different gear here, okay? So uh, you can't be anything you want to be. So kids, I, I, what I, I found out, you know, here's what I did with my boys. Seth, you know, Seth, let's try football. No, Seth, that, that ain't you. Seth, let's try baseball. That, that ain't you. Let's try basketball. Music, ball, that was you. Okay, Zach, let's try ba- ba- basketball. Son, you're killing people. I mean, you're, you're, this is not you. You're like a bull in the china shop on the court. Basketball's not your sport. Baseball, that's not, you know, that's, that's not you. Football, hey, you can do that, okay? So I fan those flames in my kids. Didn't let them do everything, but I fan those flames. So you need to do that. So don't hear me wrong, right? I'm a sports nut, you know that. But listen, if I'm more interested in, in, in my kid being the best at sports to the point that it takes them out of church for seasons, who am I worshiping? What am I doing for my kids? What am I teaching them is the most important thing in their life. My son that played football literally got a scholarship to play in college, and he goes to play in college. His freshman year, he starts. He's a lineman. He starts. He comes home at Christmas break. He starts all games except the first game. He comes home at Christmas break, and, 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 and he's 19 years old. It took him 15 minutes to get out of the bed. And I, I sit down. And I say, son, we got to have a talk. You're, let's, be, let's be real. You're not going to play in the NFL. Can't be anything you want to be. You're not going to be an effort. You're not big enough. You're not fast enough. What do you want to do? You're wrecking your body. You're 19 year old. What, what, what are you going to do here, right? And so we we, we have that talk. My, my my point is, listen. What's the greatest thing for my kid? Because my son couldn't play football forever, because it's temporary. But Jesus is forever. Eternity, heaven's forever. The greatest thing I can do for my kid is pour Jesus into them. Oh, I'm gonna pour football into my kids too if that's what they're good at. If they're not, I'm gonna pour music into them or whatever they're good at. I'm gonna pour that in them. It's just not gonna take the place of Jesus. It's not gonna take the place. You, you, can, you can do both. You, you know, the, the problem is, is when we just ride off entire seasons because, man, I, my, what are we worshiping? It's the seduction. It's the seduction. Am, am, man, am, are, are, you, are you picking up what I'm dropping? I mean, it's the seduction. What are you seduced by? What, what, what is it that lures you and pulls you away? We see it going on in our world. We see it all over our world, right? And this battle, and it can get hopeless, but here's the, I, I wanted to leave you with, a, with, one, with one final thing because I can't preach a message like the sword and the seduction. It's like, oh, man, it's hope. But let me tell you something. There's one final S, and I tried to, you know, c- come up with, and it's stomped because I'm going to tell you the beast gets stomped in the end. He gets stomped, man. I, I mean, he, he, here's what John says. He was and he was not, was not. But then he'll come back just before, he'll be come back from the bottomless pit to be thrown into eternal destruction. And, 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 and why what it says he was and he was not. Now, what does that mean? Remember, when Jesus, when, when Jesus defeated death, came out of the grave, murdered, came out of the grave, went back to heaven. What did we already say? We said that it says that Satan fell. All right, so where did he fall from? Heaven, was he in heaven? No, but he could go before God to accuse God's people. Remember, that's what Job was all about, the whole story of Job, remember? So he he would go before God and accuse God's people. 
But then when Jesus died the death of those who would believe of the elect, then he comes out of the grave, goes to heaven. What did Paul say? Hey, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You have nothing to, to condemn anyone about. You have nothing to go and accuse anyone because there's no condemnation in this. So you're done. Get out of here, right? You can no longer go before God. So, so he is thrown out. He was and he was not, but he's coming back again. We see this pattern play over. And, and, and so, so, so now, is Satan still active? Yes, the dragon's still active, but he's limited in power so that the gospel can go around to the ends of the earth, as, as you said, right? And we live in that age right now where we need to be doing everything to take the gospel uh, as far as we can because he's limited so that the gospel can go. But there will be a day do we see it getting approaching faster and faster? Is it quicker and quicker in our, in our, in our, out of our windshield? Are we getting closer, do you think, with everything that's going on? Are you beginning to see this play out before your eyes? And it says that he'll come back, and we see this over and over, and people will marvel. He'll come back because he was and he was not, and people will marvel because he was and he was not. I mean, man, we see this over and over with Pharaoh, right? I mean, Pharaoh was destroyed, and then another took his place. Wow, another took his place. Wow, we see it with Nero, and then Domitian, and then another takes his place. But people will marvel, and you say, how in the world is people gonna marvel at evil? And it says that he's gonna come back, and he's gonna assemble all the earth dwellers together for battle against Jesus. Who are the earth dwellers? Those who do not follow the Lord, those who don't know Jesus, those who are unsaved. Is that what we're moving to in our world? That they're battling, they're assembling for battle against Jesus and his church? Church, church, listen, you live in a country with freedom, and now you, it's getting to where you, can I even share my faith at work without losing my job? Do you think that they're assembling for battle against Jesus and his church? Is it getting closer, in, and people are enamored by this beast? You say, how can people be enamored with something that evil? That's easy. I mean, when people do not follow God, they replace him with something. I mean, it's easy. How in the world does people in Germany cheer Hitler? Remember how evil Hitler was? And people in Germany were cheering Hitler. You say, how in the world could you cheer a, a, a just an absent personified evil? Because when you don't follow God, you replace him with something, and you're blinded, and you're, and you're used as a tool of the beast. Earth dweller, you don't want to be used as a tool of the beast, those who don't follow Christ. That's what we see, and it says, guess what? He's coming, he was and he was not, he's coming back, but only for an hour. Did you get that? What does that mean? It means his time is limited. Not a little hour, just a short time, and then what's gonna happen? He's stoned. He's going to hell. Here's what you need to understand. Do not buy the myth that hell is a, pl hell's a place and, and, air, and people who are there, and then, man, Satan's ruling hell. And he's turning up the heat, right? I mean, don't be buying the fact that Satan's got a pitchfork running around, turning up the heat in hell, and he's ruling hell. No, he's burning in hell. He's ruling nothing. You got to understand that. He's stoned, folks. All the evil that you see, all the things that are confusing you, the answer is not financial. It's not political. The answer is, is, is spiritual. There's a battle raging right now. There's a battle raging for the souls of men and women. There's a spiritual battle between the lamb and between the dragon. And don't be confused about the outcome. It's settled. But in the meantime, we're in the middle of the battle. That's what the problem is. And so don't be trying to say, oh man, we got to do this. Here's the answer, Jesus. That's the answer. That's the, the church is the steward of the answer that the world needs. The only answer that'll fix our world. We as Christians are stewards of that answer. Man, the smartest people on the earth are not stewards. We can get a bunch of scientists in a room, and I love science. Man, I love it. But we can get a bunch of scientists in the room, they will not figure out what's wrong with our world. We can get a bunch of economists in our room, they will not figure out what's wrong with our world. Who we, who's going to figure it out? Christians. We're already told. All we got to do is study the Bible. That's what's wrong. The problem is sin. The answer is Jesus. So if you don't know Jesus today, right now, I would ask you and plead with you to give your heart to Jesus. Give your heart to Jesus before it's too late. Man, give your heart to Jesus. Bow your heart and your need to him. That's the only way you'll be on the winning team. Give your heart to Jesus today. Text the word Jesus to the number on the screen and someone will be in touch with you. If you're in a room, you can do that, or come and see us, but give your heart to Jesus today if you're uh, 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 not a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, 
If you are, church, here's what I would say. Wake up. Or here's the question I would ask myself. Are you a spotless bride? Spotless don't mean perfect. That's not what I mean. Are you a, 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 a faithful bride? Or are you a whore this morning? Are you a faithful bride? Or are you a prostitute? Or are, are you giving your body to everything and anything? that promises you some pleasure or some money or some fulfillment or something that you're seeking that's not God. Church, what is it that, what has seduced you? What is, your, what is your, the, the thing that most seduces you? And you need to pray, God, get that out of my life. God, help me to not be seduced and led astray. God, help me to not be blind. Help me to know and be able to speak the truth into my life. And when somebody comes along and speaks the truth into my life, help me to accept it. God, where am I being unfaithful to you today? That's the question, church, that we've got to ask. That's the question that we've got to ask because we want to be that bride, that faithful bride, that, that, that when Jesus returns, man, we are ready. We are ready for the bridegroom. And you know what? Here's, what? here's what I want to leave you with. If you're not a believer, today come to Jesus. If you are today, I would say, hey, ask yourself, are you faithful or are you unfaithful? In what area do you need to confess and repent? Because guess what? Jesus is coming and he has already won. He's already won. See, we can look at everything that's going on and we can go, you know what? I hate that, but, I don't have, I, but, but I, I'm not hopeless. I've got hope. I hate that but I know that Jesus has already won. I know why that happens, because Satan, because sin, because deception, that's why that happens, but I know Jesus has won. And you know what that ought to cause us to do today, Christian? It ought to cause us to not be hopeless, but to, in hope, worship Jesus. In a world of crazy, Jesus is the constant. And so let's worship him. And that's what I want you to do right now, man. I want you to, I, I want to I ask us to stand up and Travis and the band to come out. And, and, and as Travis and the band comes out, I just want to ask you to worship Jesus. If you know him, if you don't know him, man, if, you, if you've never surrendered your heart to him, read the words on the screen. Just, just read the words. But if you know him, right now you can look and say, hey, I know the world's crazy, but I know he wins. I know the world's crazy, but I know he's the constant. And I want to worship him and give him all at this very moment. So right now, as Travis begins, I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna worship. And as we worship, man, you give him your all. Father, we love you. Thank you, Father, for your word. Help us to be faithful to you. God, I know that we're all seduced. We are all seduced. And we can be seduced so easily to follow after things that are not of you. We can be seduced to give our heart to something besides you. God, please help us to walk in your ways, to love you, to trust you, to worship you. God, help us to, to give our all to you. And Lord, I just thank you for a church, Father, where we can dive into your word, where we can say hard things because hard things produce soft hearts. But God, thank you for a church that understands that soft words produce hard hearts. I pray for a soft-hearted church that's passionate about your gospel, that loves you, that knows that the, that the time is getting close. God, that, the, that, that, that as we're in this battle, it's getting more intense. The time's getting close. And I pray that we would be like the virgins who trim our wicks and we're ready when you come, as your word says, as Jesus told the parable, that we are ready for the bridegroom. And God, that we would be ready to go home with you. And Lord, in, until you do, that we would be working, that we would be sharing the gospel, that we would be worshiping, that it would be obvious to people that you are our king. And we live our lives in a way that says, all hail King Jesus. Help us to do that today and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.